1984 and Big Brother is watching you play video games. It's his turn next. Stop hogging the controller. It's NES Works Guide in episode 19. Now that we've completed our survey of Famicom and SG-1000 releases for 1983, we look ahead to the following year. From the time of the system's debut in July 1983, Sega eclipsed Nintendo's output with 21 games to Nintendo's 9, while Nintendo's releases offered superior audio and visual quality. Things will be slowing down for Sega in 1984, while Nintendo will continue its steady pace of releases and introduce some new innovations that will go a long way toward making the Famicom the more appealing platform. According to a number of sources dating all the way back to David Chef's NES-era book Game Over, that transformation began when Nintendo issued a voluntary recall on the original family computer hardware at the beginning of 1984. While well, Nintendo explained the recall as an attempt to patch up a minor processor flaw that could cause games to become unstable under certain circumstances, the replacement process also gave Nintendo a chance to retire the soft, chiclet-like square buttons of the Famicom controller in favor of round, hard plastic buttons that offered a more responsive action. The recall evidently worked well as a PR move, painting Nintendo as a good corporate citizen willing to eat a loss in order to put things right for consumers. And, in response, sales of Famicom began to surge. But really, you don't need to look any further than the console's catalog to explain its popularity. Nintendo began firing on all cylinders in 1984. In fact, unlike the uneven 83 Famicom library, every single one of Nintendo's Famicom carts for the first half of the year would make their way to the US, which means we've already looked at these games on NES Works proper, so there's no need to dwell for too long. I made a case for Tennis's merits in the very second episode of NES Works, but I think its appeal is even easier to understand when held side by side with Sega's Champion Tennis. That Sega and Logitech venture was pretty top of the line as far as home tennis games when it launched. Then just a few months later, Nintendo debuted its own take on the sport and rendered it more or less obsolete. It's not just that the Famicom version looks nicer, with colorful sprites and less colorful courts, it's that Nintendo harnessed that power to make the game play better. The detailed characters are portioned correctly relative to the camera's point of view, and their sprites appear to have more accurate collision detection, which causes them to interact more realistically with the ball. Likewise, the ball scales up and down relative to its location to the player's viewpoint, shrinking down as it flies into the back court, and growing proportionately larger as it sails into the air and moves toward the camera. It's a simple effect in a simple game, but the overall effect is that it plays wonderfully, presenting a perfect synthesis of tech and artwork to enhance its concept. Likewise, Pinball also benefits from tech improvements over previous video Pinball Sims. The table here is spread across two screens, allowing the on-table elements to appear larger and more detailed than in Sega Flipper. It's strange that the game doesn't take advantage of the NES's hardware-level support for smooth scrolling, instead flipping between sections of the table, but the change is instantaneous and never feels disorienting. There's even a bonus screen that calls back to the proto-video pinball games of the past, working essentially as a Donkey Kong-inspired breakout clone. But most importantly, the ball physics are spot on. Perfect? Probably not. But they're a massive improvement over any console pinball game before it. The ball interacts with the table in convincing ways, with minor variances in your interactions. Which is to say the timing of your flippers. Exerting a small amount of influence over the ball's movement and interactions with the passive interactive elements of the board. The ball moves pretty slowly here relative to the one in the more realistic Sega Flipper, but that works in Famicom Pinball's favor, accounting for the difference in your brain's reactions to a video ball versus a real one, and giving you enough time to respond properly to the on-screen action. And the more colorful and detailed visuals allow the table to include a healthy selection of interactive elements, like stand-up targets, rollovers, and matching elements. Pinball has absolutely been eclipsed by subsequent video pinball sims, but for 1984, this was the one to get. The first of Famicom's two big innovations for 1984, Wild Gunman brought highly accurate light gun shooting to home consoles. 
While this was by no means the first video light gun device for home systems, it was unquestionably the most accurate to date thanks to the way it synced with and read the television display. Wild Gunman itself was a fairly basic offering to make use of the gun tech, but given its importance to the company, the original pre-video Wild Gunman arcade installation single-handedly saved Nintendo from bankruptcy in the 70s, you can see why Nintendo put so much emphasis on it. This version shipped as a standalone cart, but also came as a bundled release in a big box that contained the gun peripheral and packaging dress that called back to the decade-old coin-op. In practice, Wild Gunman is a slow-paced shooting gallery. It's not even about accuracy. The point of the entire thing is to react to on-screen prompts by drawing as quickly as possible. So ironically, outside of the B mode, it doesn't really do anything to showcase the impressive accuracy, which was the Famicom gun's big selling point. But let it never be said, Nintendo didn't understand the importance, and more to the point, the marketability, of its own heritage from the very start. Another callback to Nintendo's pre-video game history, Duck Hunt was issued in a box sporting the same lavender trim as Wild Gunman, evidently the official color of shooting. More dynamic and exciting shooting simulation than Wild Gunman, Duck Hunt hinges entirely on accuracy, demanding players take aim and gun down a set number of ducks as they flutter about the screen. Even more so than Wild Gunman and its cartoonish outlaws and banditos, Duck Hunt leans heavily on the personality Famicom's graphics infused into the visuals. The ducks are slightly comical, but it's really the player's companion, a lumpy animated hound, that makes Duck Hunt memorable. Your retriever excitedly produces the bodies of all the ducks you've gunned down to commemorate your success, and mockingly laughs at you when you miss. Again, the system's detailed and colorful sprites went a long way toward giving Famicom a premium feel. And then on the boring side of things, there was also a clay skeet shooting mode, another callback to Nintendo's 70s arcade history. Like Pinball, Golf was co-developed by HAL Labs. And like that game, this Famicom release compared quite favorably to anything that had come before it, including the SG-1000's take on the sport. The interface absolutely is the difference. By turning Golf into a system of meters and targeting reticles, HAL and Nintendo abandoned the illusion of moving actively around the course and simply let Golf be a menu-based sim. Your manga-esque duffer avatar, possibly meant to be Mario, belies the seriousness of the simulation taking away beneath the hood of this one. Golf convincingly models club dynamics, wind speed and direction, and even the topography of the green to present a sports sim that can easily be grasped even by golf novices, yet poses enough challenge to keep even a seasoned pro on their toes. But the combination of the targeting crosshair to determine the direction of your drive and the meters that dictate the force of your swing make the difference here. They're not radically removed from what Logitech and Sega built for champion golf, but their simplicity and directness does wonders for giving this golf adaptation a truly intuitive design. Hogan's Alley brings us to the third and final Nintendo-made light gun game for Famicom. Yep, that's it. There would be several more first-party light gun titles for NES through the years, but in Japan, this is as far as Nintendo took its support for the peripheral. As much as we considered the American equivalent, the Zapper, an iconic part of Nintendo NES history, in Japan, this thing was barely even more valuable than Rob. Ultimately, the Famicom gun would see a total of six, six licensed releases, a pittance, compared to the 14 published under license for NES. Despite Nintendo's legacy of light gun creations throughout the 1970s in Japanese homes and arcades, when it came to Famicom, the domestic audience met the gun with a resounding shrug. Hogan's Alley is unique among this trio for not, to my knowledge, having been based on an existing Nintendo toy or installation. Instead, Hogan's Alley places you in a virtual shooting gallery where you must gun down criminals and try not to kill innocent civilians. A secondary mode takes you through a more elaborate gallery in which you move along a path before stopping at key points. And a third challenge is you to keep a series of tin cans in the air by shooting at them. It's a decent enough game, but clearly not enough to set afire the hearts of players in Japan. I guess maybe it's difficult for them to relate to trigger-happy American cops when their police are generally mostly there to give directions and rescue kittens from telephone poles. And finally, we end the Nintendo-only era of Famicom with Donkey Kong 3, released just a week shy of Famicom's first birthday. An arcade conversion of the least-loved Donkey Kong creation outside of Donkey Kong Jr. math, Donkey Kong 3 fares reasonably well on cartridge. 
Of course, the action here does feel slightly unavoidably compressed since this is a vertical shooter that's been forced onto a horizontal screen. But as with the original Donkey Kong, the vertical compression is quite marginal and doesn't noticeably impact play. As in arcades, Mario is nowhere to be found here, off busily kicking sewer turtles. So Donkey Kong instead has to settle for harassing a gardener named Stanley. Kong himself hangs at the top of the screen while players use safe, health-promoting DDT to fend off a swarm of insects who swoop down, murderously plundering crops from Stanley's greenhouse. It's more a shooter than a platformer, despite the presence of platforms, and taken on its own merits holds up as an enjoyable game. The Donkey Kong sequel is a little weird, though certainly not off-putting enough to account for Kong disappearing from the Nintendo lineup for literally a decade. There would be just a couple of weeks shy of exactly 10 years between Donkey Kong 3 on Famicom and Donkey Kong for Game Boy. Then again, Nintendo didn't have to pimp out Donkey Kong quite as vigorously as they might have, because just a few weeks after Donkey Kong 3's release, something vital happened for Famicom that would ensure its continued existence for more than a decade to come. On July 28th, Hudson Soft published the game Nuts and Milk. Note that I said Hudson. This was a third-party release for Famicom, published not by Nintendo, but by a different company altogether. By now, a handful of games developed by non-Nintendo creators had made their way to Famicom, HAL Labs work on golf being the highest profile, and Sega had published something like a dozen different externally developed games on SG-1000. However, Sega published everything for its system under its own label, a process they would uphold in Japan with just a couple of exceptions until the 16-bit Mega Drive launched. This gave Sega tremendous control over their market, but it also appears to have had a chilling effect on publishing partnerships. By allowing external developers to produce, ship, and sell their own Famicom projects, Nintendo created a more profitable and more inviting environment for other creators. Of course, Nintendo would ultimately walk back this generosity to a certain degree once Famicom took off, building security measures into the Western NES console and the Famicom disk system that required third parties to work through an official first-party manufacturing pipeline. But would Famicom ever have taken off had Nintendo not effectively taken this laissez-faire approach to third parties at the beginning? Of course, Nintendo needed only look overseas to the Atari 2600 market to see the ultimate endpoint of unregulated third-party publishing. But who could have predicted that the Famicom, a system that launched with hardware defects and lagged far behind the competition's output for the first year of its life, would ultimately nearly double the 2600's install base around the world? And it's not as though Nintendo's allies were just anyone. Famicom's externally published releases in 1984 came from reliable studios known for quality. PC gaming powerhouse Hudson and arcade megalith Namco. Hudson was a close friend to Nintendo by this point. Shortly before Nuts and Milk shipped, Nintendo published their first non-game utility for Famicom in the form of Famicom Basic. Famicom Basic lent an air of truth to the name Family Computer, a keyboard add-on that paired with a cartridge capable of running a specialized version of RAM. This nudged Famicom a little closer to the likes of Sega's SC3000, the MSX, and the Coleco Atom. While Famicom would never be a full-fledged computer, Famicom Basic allowed many aspiring game developers to cut their teeth. And they could save their creations with an add-on tape cassette device, the Famicom Data Recorder, which prefigured the Famicom Disk System. As for where Hudson fits into all of this, well, Hudson produced the Famicom Basic software package. After all, the company's talent had extensive experience with home computers and had released quite a few hit microcomputer games by this point, so they were a natural fit for the task. Nuts and Milk showcases their aptitude. Originally released on multiple computer platforms throughout 1983 and early 84, Nuts and Milk was a top-down maze action game in which players, controlling a little critter named Milk, needed to reach his girlfriend, Yogurt, while avoiding a wandering menace named Nuts. On Famicom, Nuts and Milk became a different game entirely, shifting from a top-down viewpoint to a side-scrolling perspective. Visually, this version seems to take its cues from Nintendo's own creations, specifically Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. It even incorporates a Nintendo-style title screen, with big, bubble-like letters on a field of black. Here we have Hudson deliberately recalibrating its work to fit the platform and its audience. There's no reason Hudson couldn't have created Nuts and Milk for SG-1000. In fact, the PC original made its debut on the MSX, a platform largely identical to SG-1000. An SG-1000 port would probably have been trivial, and it wouldn't have required Hudson to reinvent the entire package from top to bottom. But I think it's safe to say that the freedom Nintendo offered at the time proved to be more attractive to Hudson, a company that would ultimately produce its own line of consoles in order to avoid living entirely under another company's thumb. Where Sega would have required nuts and milk to ship under the Sega label, presumably granting Sega the largest share of the game's revenue, 
On Famicom, Nuts and Milk shipped as a Hudson game. There's zero question of how well this worked out for Hudson. The company's earliest Famicom releases, published for a system with a growing user base hungry for new software, were tremendous successes. Loadrunner would sell a million copies on Famicom, a great achievement by modern standards that translated into a nearly unprecedented hit in the infant Japanese console market. It helped, of course, that Hudson seemed to have an intuitive grasp of the platform. Nuts and Milk looked like a Famicom game, and its aesthetic camouflage paired neatly with its overhauled gameplay. Nuts and Milk for Famicom takes place across 50 stages in which players have two tasks. They need to help Milk collect a bunch of fruit, and once that's done, they need to make their way to the house where yogurt awaits them. Meanwhile, they need to do their best to avoid the nefarious Nuts, who seeks to murder Milk for presumably his own private reasons. Best not to speculate. The Make It Like Nintendo ethos is pretty blatant in the play design, as Nuts and Milk plays like nothing so much of a mashup of Nintendo's first three Famicom releases. Milk can jump here as in Donkey Kong Jr., he must evade Nuts' dogged pursuit as in Popeye, and he collects objects before climbing to the top of the screen, as if ladies' scattered bonus items in Donkey Kong were mandatory collectibles. This makes it pretty different from the PC version, where Milk couldn't jump, and the jumping and falling mechanics come with the limitations reminiscent of early Mario. If Milk falls from too great a height, he won't die, but he will be momentarily stunned, which forces you to play with a certain degree of caution. On top of that, Hudson even mirrored Nintendo's own difficulty tuning options. The title screen allows one or two players to select either Game A or the more challenging Game B, just like Donkey Kong and so on. And here you can see the appeal over Nintendo's own action platformer lineup. Nuts and Milk is a vastly larger game than the launch titles, with 50 stages rather than 3 or 4. The action moves a little more loosely and it feels much less punishing. Not only that, but Nuts and Milk evidently parlays Hudson's work on the Famicom Basic system as well. Perhaps inspired by its sibling release Loadrunner, which according to different sources, Hudson either officially shipped three days after this cartridge or on the same day as, Nuts and Milk includes a game editor mode that allows players to design their own stage layouts. Of course, you can't save these creations to cartridge, but if you had picked up a Famicom basic set and data recorder, your own personal masterpieces could be saved to cassette and traded with eager friends. A meat space precursor to Doom WAD trading. Taken in the context of its era, this is a momentous game that has a critical place in the history of gaming. Not only did it represent the Famicom's first real step toward becoming more than just a machine for Nintendo games, its design and tech hooks demonstrate just what third parties could bring to the platform. And even now, Nuts and Milk remains a pretty fun little puzzle platformer. The game never made its way west on NES, as the only conversion of the game to make its way beyond Japan appears to have been a Commodore 64 release called Hot Pop, but its overseas absence surely has more to do with timing than quality. By the time Hudson began releasing its own NES games in the US, it was already the latter half of 1988, and Nuts and Milk would have been far too dated to be competitive against the likes of Super Mario Bros. 2 and Zelda 2. Yes, two archaic Hudson Famicom carts did show up in the US in 1987, but those were published here by Bruderbund, and were console conversions of Bruderbund's own properties, Loadrunner and Radon Bungling Bay. So all of this left poor Nuts and Milk out in the cold. So while circumstances would ensure Western Nintendo fans would never know Nuts and Milk as anything more than a game to snicker at as they waggled their tongues about those wacky Japanese, in reality it's quite a noteworthy work, and understandably is looked back on fondly by those who were there in 1984, as Famicom early adopters. And it helped do its part to guarantee that the Famicom would be adopted by millions more. Not bad for this humble little platformer. Next time on NES Works Guide In, three more for 84.